everyone. Um, we're going to give it about two more minutes until we get started. Um, there's a couple technical notes up on the screen right now. Um, just so everyone knows, you're all auto muted. Um, you can pop questions into the chat on the right, um, and I will be able to answer them. Um, we're just waiting until uh, everyone gets a chance to join in and do a little bit of troubleshooting just to make sure the platform is working for everybody. Um, so I'll give it about two more minutes and then we will dive right in. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, we're going to get started now. Um, so just a couple of quick notes before we dive into things. Um, everyone is auto muted. Um, you won't be able to speak uh, out loud to us, um, but you can send questions uh, in the chat on the right to myself, uh, Kevin, and Sean, who are going to be our two presenters today. Um, if you just send them to everyone, um, then we'll all be able to see. If you have a specific troubleshooting question, um, you can send it to me, and I show up as Shoreline Cleanup. Um, we will have a link to the webinar available afterward. It will be sent out to all participants. Um, so not immediately afterward. Um, it's a pretty big file, so we got to compress it and put it on YouTube, and then we will send it out to everyone. Um, I am going to uh, give it about two minutes and then get started. It looks like we still got a couple of people joining in. Um, sounds good. Okay, so um, quickly, I will give a little bit of an intro to the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. Um, so we are a conservation partnership um, by WWF Canada and OceanWise. We've been around since 1994, um, and we have created the infrastructure throughout Canada for individuals to be able to lead cleanups in their own local communities and to take agency um, to lead their peers in a cleanup that looks 
the best to them. So small groups, large groups, anytime, um, any location, we will work with you to make it possible. Um, right now, uh, we have suspended cleanups until further notice. Unfortunately, we can't guarantee the safety of our participants um, at this time. So we wanna just make sure that everyone is being as careful as possible and um, staying off of the shorelines um, for the time being. Um, we will be updating all of our participants um, when we're able to resume cleanups. Um, we're, uh, we're sad about this news as well, um, but we'd love to kind of work with you to plan your fu future cleanups um, and to help you with anything in the interim time. Um, we're all still here. Um, we'll be leading webinars and any online engagement, um, and you have any questions, you're able to chat with us. Um, this is a great time to get involved in education and engagement. Um, we are super lucky today to have um, Kevin Gedling from Jasper National Park um, and Sean Proctor, who is an amazing outdoor guide with us. Uh, they are both going to be participating in our chat um, in a couple of minutes. Um, giving you some super interesting info. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Kevin um, to get started. Okay, uh, can you guys can all hear me okay here? Yes, we can, Kevin. Okay, great, all right, away we go. Okay, great. All right, uh, well, thanks very much, uh, Julie, for, for having us uh, be part of the call today. Um, yeah, like I say, uh, my name is Kevin. I, I was the partnering and engagement officer for Jasper National Park. Um, I'm actually starting a new job, but I'm still at home, like many of you, um, for the Northwest Territories shortly. But uh, we're talking a bit about uh, the cleanup work that we do in Jasper National Park, which I've been involved in. Um, I worked on our volunteer program there until uh, just a couple of months ago, so since 2013. And uh, Sean Proctor, uh, he's an interpretive guide uh, in Jasper National Park. He runs his own guiding outfit. Um, he's gonna be uh, talking a bit more as well. He, he, his company volunteers with the Jasper program and he does a lot of really cool cleanup stuff as you're gonna be seeing in a bit. Um, so yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about Jasper National Park, uh, what kind of makes it unique. Uh, a little bit of the ecosystems and background, and uh, also look at some of the the uh, interesting sort of different sort of locations that we have in Jasper that we've been doing cleanups on, and uh, hopefully some of these will inspire you to look for some of those uh, exciting overlooked, maybe underappreciated uh, aquatic ecosystems and cleanup sites wherever you happen to live today. So we'll just sort of get right into that, and uh, yeah. The first thing to mention, of course, is that um, like uh, Julia was saying at the beginning, uh, coronavirus is still a pretty big part of Canada, of course. Um, you know, we don't have to talk a lot about that. Um, but I have to put this up first and foremost that um, we're going to be showing some really beautiful photos of Jasper National Park, talking a lot about some beautiful places, uh, some spots that you may want to take ownership of and clean up of wherever you live. But just remember that uh, the current situation involving COVID-19 includes that all Parks Canada sites and facilities are currently closed. So if you're inspired by this talk to go and visit the park, just save it for later. Um, we're getting closer to probably opening, I sure hope so, because that's the parks is an assignment. But um, yeah, just respect uh, the current situation revolving COVID-19. And also, you know, if uh, you're going to a provincial park, wherever you happen to live, uh, just do some research before going, and if they have closures on to those places, respect those measures as well. It, it's tough on everybody, especially us outdoorsy people that like to lead cleanups and initiatives like this, but it, it's, again, it's really, really just an important thing. So uh, just, just stick with it for a little bit longer, and uh, like Julia was saying, uh, get those plans for your cleanups uh, really solid before you head on out. So next. So Jasper National Park is located here. Uh, I think a lot of folks will probably have an idea of where we're located, but just in case you've never actually been to Jasper or are totally familiar, uh, we're located uh, in the Canadian Rockies right along the BC and Alberta border. 
so basically, the Continental Divide, uh, we are the largest of the Canadian Rocky Mountain National Parks, one of four Parks Canada sites that are connected together to protect the huge part of the Canadian Rockies. So our sister parks, Banff, Kootenai, and Yoho are, are all national parks that uh, are joined to the landscape that we protect. And uh, there's three other provincial parks on, on the BC side, uh, Hamber, Mount Robinson, and Mount Assiniboine that are part of the, the mountain parks complex, if you will, uh, Jasper being the biggest of them all. Uh, Jasper National Park, as uh, as you're probably pretty familiar, is a very mountainous place. Uh, we are famous probably because we're the biggest park in a lot of different ways in the Rockies. Uh, we have over 11,000 square kilometers of protected habitat that makes up Jasper National Park. So that's that's uh, almost double the size of Banff. That's uh, bigger than a lot of national parks. So bigger than some small countries. Uh, we have almost a thousand kilometers of official hiking trail uh, and multi-use trails in, in the park. And uh, we probably have at least as much uh, distance of trails and unofficial backcountry routes that uh, make this area just legendary. It's our backcountry, I think, that really is at the heart of what Jasper National Park is all about. Uh, we have the biggest mountain in Alberta, uh, Mount Columbia, at about 3,700 meters, a little taller than that. Uh, the biggest natural lake is uh, Moline Lake. It's over 22 kilometers long. Uh, the biggest ice field in the Rocky Mountains is, uh, of course, the Columbia Ice Field with more than 100 uh, square kilometers of ice. And uh, we are an absolutely huge dark sky preserve. So uh, we have a really great uh, uh, dark sky festival that happens here usually in October, fingers crossed. And uh, yeah, just everything about the park is, is, is huge. So. Uh, when we manage this park, uh, keeping in mind that, of course, Parks Canada, we protect and present uh, nationally significant examples of national and cultural heritage for Canadians, of course. But some of our sites are UNESCO, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites, which means that we manage these parks on a global scale, uh, not just for Canadians, but the standards that we manage this park are like world-class standards that we have to live up to. Um, not just for, for Canadians, but basically for all of humanity. Next. Next. Cool. <laughs> uh, Jasper, uh, when we talk to visitors uh, who come to Jasper National Park, we ask people, what are the two biggest things that kind of drive you to want to visit the mountains? Um, of course, out of the visitors that we do get in the park in the summertime, uh, everyone answers, the mountains, of course, right? I mean, why else would you go? <laughs> um, beautiful mountain landscapes. But the other uh, common resounding answer that people usually give us is, of course, to see wildlife. And uh, Jasper National Park being so huge and having big valleys and lots of landscape for wildlife to get around, um, our biodiversity in the park is pretty good and ecological integrity is, is, is pretty good from all the reports that we usually get. Uh, so examples, we have about 277 different bird species. There's probably more others that maybe we haven't recorded, so especially since changes in climate are starting to occur, of course. And uh, more than 69, well, at least 69 species of mammals and uh, potentially more, so. In the mountain landscapes, uh, Jasper National Park, uh, Banff, Kootenai, and Yoho are all basically uh, defined by what we call mountain ecoregions. Uh, where you go higher in elevation or lower in elevation tends to sort of impact, of course, um, the biodiversity of the place that you're in and the wildlife and the landscape, uh, wildlife that are able to use the landscape that surround you. Um, when you're thinking about coming to mountain places like Jasper, this is probably what you're looking for. And it's where I like to spend the most of my time, if I can. Uh, the Alpine Zone. And in Jasper, we have three ecoregions basically defined by elevation. Uh, more than about 45 to 50 percent of our mountain park landscapes are locked up in what we call the Alpine Zone. And basically, anytime you look at a, at a big rocky mountain landscape, um, look at the tree line and look at above the tree line, anything that's trees and above trees where nothing is growing for trees, that's basically alpine terrain. So about 45%, 50% or so of our mountain park landscapes in Jasper is a, what we call alpine. Next one. 
Another 45 to 50% of the park is what we call subalpine zone. And basically what this is, it's an interface area between the valley bottoms and the mountaintops where those tree lines occur. It's a high enough elevation where you don't get deciduous trees growing anymore, like aspens or birches, things like that. Um, but you do get some of the characteristics of both landscapes. It's an area that, uh, of course, right now, we're still talking uh, early May, so it's really locked up on a lot of ice and snow, just like the Alpine is. Uh, so a lot of wildlife activity is kind of compressed down into the valley bottom habitats. Uh, a lot of our hiking trails and backcountry destinations tend to be in the subalpine terrain. Uh, but at this time of the year, it's still relatively early uh, for wildlife to be making use of that spot. So when you think about how harsh the alpine zone will be with the weather that happens up there, and then sort of that harsh lingering condition in the subalpine, uh, there's really not a whole lot of landscape left. So the next slide. And this is the montane zone. And in the valley bottoms of Jasper and Banff National Park too, um, we have about maybe five or seven percent of our parks that's a, basically a montane terrain. Essentially, it's a valley bottom with dry conditions, uh, grasslands, deciduous trees. Uh, the highest amount of biodiversity found in our mountain landscapes is found in this little tiny area, if you will, of the park landscapes overall. It also tends to be the place where the vast majority of the visitation to our popular places in Bay of Jasper tends to reside and kind of hang out. So about maybe 80% or so of all the visitation to Jasper National Park, let's say it's uh, 2 million people or so a year is kind of the average before uh, this year, then uh, a lot of that activity, the town sites, the campgrounds, it's all concentrated right down in these little valley bottom areas, which uh, again, look pretty big when you're standing in the middle of one, but uh, when we're done, take a good look at Google Earth, look at our mountain landscapes a little bit, and you'll see that those kind of green ribbons that wind through those rocky landscapes are actually pretty, pretty few and far between. So yeah, so they're pretty important places, and they tend to be where a lot of our cleanups uh, are focused as well. So a couple things to do with uh, the trash that we find in, in Jasper National Park. Uh, the good news is that we don't have a lot. Uh, you can see that this is a, uh, a relatively small amount of debris <laughs> that we picked up during a cleanup, uh, just a couple buckets worth. And so uh, a lot of you folks have probably seen much, much more horrific cleanups than this. Um, I have two, but unfortunately, this is kind of like an average everyday cleanup in Jasper. Um, this is a parking lot at a very popular place, some of you may know, called Old Fort Point. And it is a place that gets a lot of use. It gets a lot of rafting activity, paddling. It's got a, several trailheads going in different ways. Uh, so a lot of visitation concentrated in one place. And a lot of the trash that we find in the park isn't really all that um, you know, intentional. It's not people just tossing stuff out of the car. I mean, that happens on the highway, like everywhere on highway. But uh, most of it tends to be the very unintentional stuff. And uh, the vast majority tends to be those really small pieces and we'll show you some examples of that in the next few minutes. Okay. <laughs> so you've got a good picture here of just an average gravel landscape. That's kind of what we find along the river sides anywhere in Jasper National Park. And you can see that little tiny blue dot in the center, that's, that's, that's micro trash. And so a lot of you folks are probably familiar that that is everywhere, right? Um, our aquatic ecosystems are incredibly sensitive in the Canadian Rockies, and uh, we're also quite aware that our ecosystems tend to be the headwaters for rivers going elsewhere. In particular, the Athabasca starts in Jasper National Park and heads up into the north through the Mackenzie River system. Um, so rather than finding a whole lot of debris, we find that we just get these little tiny bits and pieces. Um, sometimes you get like wrappers, you get chip bags kind of blowing away from a car into the woods, you tend to find that maybe a 30 or 50 meter sort of perimeter around a picnic area or a parking lot is where that trash tends to be kind of focused. And then when you get past it into the woods, there's really almost no signs of human activity except for the sounds of people enjoying themselves through the woods. So, um, so the cleanups, like I say, we don't have a huge amount of volume. So we're never gonna win any awards for the most amount of stuff. But when we're doing the cleanups in our park, we tend to be really try to picky, almost meticulous, trying to get as many of these little tiny micro trash bits, cigarette butts, and all these little bits and pieces as we can. 
uh, another thing that we tend to find is that uh, in the cleanups that we do in Jasper, uh, we've been doing a lot of cleanups with very small groups. So in this case, uh, we're doing a little bit of a cleanup at Athabasca Falls, and uh, we only had about five or six or so volunteers join us for this particular event. Um, last year, we had like 17 different cleanups uh, of different sizes and scales, but most of them were of this size. And uh, because they're such small cleanups, um, not all of them were registered in the cleanup website, I should have. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, um, lots of small groups. Uh, they're really easy to manage. It's easy to take a few people out and get people together. And uh, we're doing cleanups along, uh, this is just a viewing platform. So you might not really think of it as a shoreline, but any place people go that's close to water for us is, is basically a shoreline because all that activity, all those little wrappers, trip bags, and things like that will blow into the woods. This takes one good rainstorm to wash that down into a canyon like this at Athabasca Falls. And uh, so we just try to prevent that by getting out and uh, hitting these places as best we can. Next. And uh, one other kind of interesting trend that we started finding in the last couple of years was uh, if you are doing a cleanup and you've got a really small group of people, um, like we were taking out a lot of the time, if you're looking for extra help or you want to turn your, your program into like an outreach activity, uh, if you set up a, a table just like you would an interpretive road station, many of folks might be interpreters, so you might be familiar with this kind of setup. Just bring on a couple of pickers, some buckets, uh, you know, bags if you prefer, and they can actually catch visitors uh, who are interested in actually taking part. Um, so you're not going to find hundreds and hundreds of people doing this, but uh, out of maybe a high visitation place like a waterfall or a viewpoint, we had about 15 or 20 people join us in this particular day at uh, Sunwapta Falls in picking up trash. It's usually families with kids that tend to be in, really interested, but what's really exciting is that I found uh, this worked really good in two or three locations in Jasper. Um, lots and lots of different peoples of different backgrounds, different cultures, usually with kids really like to sort of like uh, get involved a little bit. And uh, yeah, this is kind of a nice extra way of uh, adding to your volunteer numbers, but also uh, creating a bit more sort of like on the spot stewardship amongst the visitation that you may have. So if you work in other protected places, uh, this is something I think probably would work uh, universally, not just in Jasper, but anywhere people visit like a beach or a park or a playground or just about anywhere really. And take it away, Sean. <laughs> Sorry, I'll just give us one sec and I will pass. Uh, oh, okay. Are you going, Sean? Good to go. Yeah, I, I also had to unmute myself. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Um, okay, hi, my name is Sean. I uh, run a guided hike and climbing company here in Jasper called Jasper Hikes and Tours. And uh, you'll see me pictured there on the right with my wife. We run it together. And uh, that shot is us at uh, another really popular place called Moline Canyon. Um, hopefully some folks that are listening in have been to Moline Canyon. It's definitely that and Mathabasca Falls are probably the two most popular places that people come to visit. And um, we guide there both summer and winter and, and we're big stewards of the park and, and we want to give back. And so one way that we like to give back is doing these shoreline cleanups in particular an annual trip to Moline Canyon to pick up the trash. And as Kevin mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of the trash is inadvertent. Uh, it's micro trash, it's, it's little plastic wrappers, and it's often found at Moline Canyon because it is such a, a spectacular place that people want to photograph. I find a lot of people just take their camera, uh, their phone or, or whatever out of their pockets and don't even notice that they're dropping trash tissues or wrappers when they do it, take the picture and then move on. And uh, Moline Canyon is a canyon with the Moline River down below, so it is definitely a shoreline, and uh, those pieces of trash will certainly get into the Moline River. That river will go into the Athabasca and ultimately to the Arctic Ocean. So it is critical, in our opinions, to clean it up, not only for the environment, but also for the beauty of the place. So uh, every year we get together, uh, usually at the end of September or early October, and um, set up the station with Parks Canada, Kevin's often at the booth, and we get as many volunteers from town to come out and help us. And then again, if there are visitors to the park and visitors to the canyon, they often join us. And it's a great way to engage with them. 
Uh, last time we had, I think it was over 40, 30 to 40 participants doing this. And, um, you know, being a canyon, we have to be super careful about people getting too close to the edge. And you'll notice that I'm hanging on a fence, and that fence generally runs along the trail. So we tell everybody volunteering, no one is allowed to cross that fence. Okay? That way, no one can potentially slip and fall into the canyon. But of course, I'm on the other side. So if there's trash, uh, it just gets reported to myself or Kevin, and Joy and I will jump the fence and go get it. Why are we allowed? Well, we're certified guides, and we're trained for um, rappelling. We're, we're canyon guides, trained through Canyon Guides International as well as um, top rope climbing instructors with the ACMD. So we've had many years of training and experience to be able to safely rappel into the canyon. And you'll see myself on the bottom left there rappelling in at um, a place uh, we call Bridge 2, so one of the pretty much the most popular spots. Uh, and you'll see a whole slew of people up on that bridge um, watching, watching me below. Uh, and so anyway, if you want to flip to the next slide, Are you able to flip to the next slide? Is that working there for you, Sean? I got the canyons one up. Oh, I don't, I don't see it at all. Yeah. I don't <laughs> see sure. it either there, uh, yeah. Oh no, let's see. Are we still uh, looking at uh, you, Kevin, on that slide with the bridge? Yeah, I'm looking uh, at it's the, the, tr tr uh, the, the double picture with myself yeah. on the fence and the, myself repelling. Interesting. Okie doke. Give us one second, everybody, and I will try and sort this out quickly. Well, what I can do is I'll tell you the story of the picture and let her figure it out, and then uh, hopefully it'll time a little bit better so we keep things rolling. Um, so you'll see on, a, on another slide, um, there's me rappelling at that same place, the bridge to uh, picking up a potato chip bag. And that one was quite a challenging one because you can only predict so much with the anchor that you set up and how gravity is going to bring you down into the canyon to pick up these pieces of trash. And they're often on precipitous ledges. And so I looked down and, and this potato chip bag was sitting on a very mossy ledge. It looked actually perfect for me to just walk on. And so I, I got the rope down. I had obviously uh, extra rope in case I was wrong. And um, got down to the, the, the mossy ledge and it definitely was not walkable at all. And so the potato chip bag is, of course, at the very end. And uh, I ended up having to go right to the very end of my rope. And there's a knot, of course, to prevent myself from repelling off the end. And so I basically repelled down to the knot. I still couldn't reach the bag. And so I, ended, I um, extended my anchor, and I could just reach the bag. And as soon as I finally did, the, the crowd of probably 30 people up on the bridge all gave a hoot and a holler and a cheer. And, and I mean, it's, it's really rewarding to do it, not only to help clean up for the environment, but um, also because every time we go to that bridge, and it's pretty much every day as we're, as we're guiding there. Uh, yeah, there we go. You can see myself uh, down at the getting the potato chip bag, but uh, that's shot from bridge two. And so that's the viewpoint that we see every day. And people come, hundreds of people every day look down and they see that potato chip bag. And, and for us to get rid of it is, is really nice. Now we look at bridge two, Look down there, and um, it looks pristine. It looks beautiful. So there you go. Um, are you able to swap? Yeah. Now, I, I, you guys want a little bit more of a story, too. So that, that bridge, uh, too, often has a lot of trash because it's, it's really popular with the bus tours, too. So it, it sees probably 10 times more people than the rest of the canyon. And uh, it, it gets a little bit of wind. And, and uh, in this case, that's a troll's hat. Uh, trolls is some kid's movie and uh, so I'm guessing it was on a, on a child and uh, a wind probably blew it off their head didn't even realize and it just went down in the canyon and uh, I just I couldn't get that one because of our anchor setup it wouldn't have been safe for me to reach it and so I, I went back a couple months later when I, I got back home I went on vacation and um, 
set up a different anchor I'd never used before and managed to get it. And that, there's a shot of me uh, finally getting that bright purple hat at the bottom. And uh, no, I did not wear it. And keep it. <laughs> so we have to uh, keep in mind the safety of everybody, right? We talked about that and the fact that uh, no one was to go over the fence. And if you guys do cleanups, um, and you don't have the experience repelling on ropes and don't have that kind of experience, then um, go, go get some training with the guide and learn before you ever consider doing it. Um, but we also have to consider the safety of the wildlife too. We're, you know, as Kevin mentioned, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and we have a responsibility, especially as stewards, to protect the landscape and to protect the animals. And so I'm not sure if anyone can guess what that bird is, but it's uh, quite a rare bird called a black swift. And it's, um, it's a species at risk. There's several species in Jasper that are species at risk. And that means that uh, Parks Canada uh, gets money annually to protect this bird. And uh, they are required to put effort into saving this species. And, uh, and so the black swift, uh, there's only about four or five nesting pairs in Moline Canyon. And that's really the only reliable place that you can visit in Moline Canyon that's got black swifts. Uh, there are numerous other canyons and I've been down most of them and um, we can now at this point as we're learning more about black swifts assume any canyon feature may have a black swift. But Moline Canyon is pretty much the only place that we, we can guarantee that we can find them. And with only four or five pairs we certainly don't want to disturb them. So as a result we only allow canyon activities outside the nesting season. They nest in the cliff walls and crevices, and they use the moss, the very moss that I was working around to get that chip bag, they use that to build their nest. So it'd be horrible for me to go down there while a black swift is trying to build their nest or take care of their young, and uh, I, I disturb them, and then their, their, their young don't make it. So um, they come from Brazil every year. Uh, they do massive migrations, and uh, it's, it's a pretty unique species that uh, goes through a lot, so we don't want to put any more uh, uh, danger into them if we don't have to. So anything uh, for repelling in the canyon has to happen after September 15th. Cool, and that's my final slide for my talk, and that's just uh, a group of us uh, back before social distancing guidelines. And uh, yeah, Suka is uh, our, our trusty companion who comes with us on our tours with the company, and uh, always on our cleanups as well. Uh, so there she is uh, helping us pick up trash at Moline Canyon, and that's Bridge 2 behind. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening to my part. Uh, Kevin's going to take over and finish off, and then I'll be around to answer any questions if you guys have any. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. Back to hearing me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Uh, so, yeah, uh, like Sean was saying, uh, you know, where we're planning our cleanups, we want to make sure we're, we're not impacting the landscape anymore than what we're – you know, intending to do, right? We're trying to clean up the place. We're not trying to have an impact on things. And, and uh, yeah, all canyons can have a lot of different um, nesting birds, not just black swifts, but there's, there's lots of other uh, wildlife that utilize canyon walls. Uh, you'd actually be surprised. <laughs> but uh, that's another workshop for another day, maybe. Um, so just to, to kind of wrap up, I was just going to talk about a couple of the most uh, unique ecosystems that we kind of find ourselves uh, doing cleanups in. Um, so, again, Jasper being such a big landscape of 11,000 square kilometers, the, the terrain and the variety of habitats is, is pretty, pretty unique. Uh, the photo here, this is Athabasca Glacier, which is the headwaters of the Sun Wapta River, and uh, is a very popular place uh, for uh, all kinds of ice walking tours. There's bus tours that lead up onto the glacier. Um, gets a lot of visitation, so of course we find ourselves uh, in the need, once again, to go in there and do some cleanups from materials that are accidentally dropped uh, up high up on the glacier by visitors. Um, there's a trail that leads right into this very spot in the photo. And uh, of course, there's some pretty big challenges that come with that. It's a very windy place. Uh, it's a very harsh place, so uh, elevation is a little bit of a factor for some people. And of course, you got to consider just that you have flexibility in your your cleanup planning because uh, you may set a particular date in mind and then actually completely change it because it's snowing. And I've had that happen on me a couple of times where I'll set a date, even in August, where I'm going to get a cleanup happening, let's say, with 
you know, people coming up from Banff or something, sometimes the day works out really great. And a couple of times, you know, yeah, it's actually snowing even in August. So uh, you just <laughs> really, really never know what glacial headwaters. Uh, so that's one kind of unique place that we find ourselves working in in Jasper. Uh, another kind of unique uh, ecosystem in this park would be roadside springs. And I would venture to say that, you know, roadside springs are not unique only to Jasper. We have all kinds of examples of roadside springs uh, along all highways in Alberta and BC and uh, every province in Canada has roadside springs of some form. They might not be mineral springs necessarily, but uh, areas where you find uh, moose and deer come out to feed or drink, uh, you know, those kinds of places uh, end up looking like roadside ditches sometimes. We don't really realize their importance. So. And this particular photo is actually a place called the Cold Sulphur Spring, which is completely ignored uh, along Highway 16 most of the time. And uh, what's unique about it is that it's cool water. It comes out with a very high concentration of hydrogen sulfide, which stinks like a hot spring. So you drive by it and you kind of wonder who in your car made a mistake not me, and uh, you wonder what it was. And it, it's a, just a really, really interesting environment. But all that windblown trash that people toss out the window ends up kind of getting caked into this really weird hydrogen sulfide mud. And so uh, also because it's consistent water springs, it's an interesting place because we can actually get in there and make it the first cleanup of the season if, if you want to, even as early as end of February or early March. When everything else is frozen, this thing is still flowing and open water. So it's important to try and reach that material and get it out of there because just down the road, it goes through a culvert, enters into a big, big wetland complex, and quick enough, it's in part of the Athabasca River. So it's uh, the type of place that this particular spot's unique to Jasper. But again, to think outside the box, you'll find all kinds of roadside springs and landscapes like this uh, in all kinds of rural areas where you're living and residing. So. It's a good place to, to think about uh, hitting if you have the opportunity uh, to do a cleanup there. And uh, forgotten wetlands. Uh, I, I call this a forgotten wetland because uh, it's an unintentional wetland. Many, many years ago when Highway 16 was built through Jasper National Park, of course, they just put these nice straightaways through flat terrain and sometimes water pooled up behind it. Uh, this is the scene as you enter the park at our west gate coming in from Mount Robson Provincial Park. And uh, not exactly a spectacular wetland complex, but now that it's there, and now that it's been there for a good 30 or 40 years at least, um, you know, the adaptations of wildlife have changed. So there are aquatic species like amphibians and even fish that utilize this place, even though many years ago, this wasn't even a wetland at all. So when you're managing a national park, you have to think about the aquatic environment and the wildlife using that place, even though it was an intended place. And it's these forgotten wetlands that often get neglected. And uh, I don't know if this slide will animate the photo, but you should be able to see the results of a cleanup we did there, Eek, right? <laughs> so while I said most of the stuff is unintentional <laughs> garbage, there are a couple exceptions to this rule. And uh, we did a cleanup on this particular spot with a staff group last year. Um, you know, so much plastic debris from uh, kind of like a, like a wayside pullout that's right beside the, the cleanup location. Um, you're probably going to find that there are things like stormwater drains, ditches, there's, uh, again, these forgotten wetlands in other places like cities and rivers, uh, all where we live and reside. So, you know, uh, if we neglect them and think about just the beautiful pristine lakes and beaches that we tend to want to flock to to run our cleanups at, then uh, you'll end up with a cleanup quite like this, where we had uh, three canoes full of stuff. Yeah, it, uh, really, yeah, but it's no longer that way anymore. Um, I know our Westgate staff, we have people who work at the gate, were continually complaining about this uh, this wetland for several years. So it was pretty rewarding to be able to sort of like uh, uh, get in there with canoes and get a little more innovative and, and get all this stuff right out of it. It was, it was, you know, it was pretty memorable, but I was pretty horrified by the amount of stuff that we found. So anyway, so don't forget about your forgotten wetlands. So there's a lot of things that we could always talk about with a, with a, with a, like a shoreline cleanups uh, webinar like this. Um, you know, Jasper is a huge landscape and uh, trying to share it with you folks in a 40 
30, 40 minute time frame is, is, is kind of hard. So uh, you'll have to come and check the place out when social distancing is, is, is uh, maybe in the rear view and we're allowed to go back to our parks and sites. Uh, in the meantime though, um, if it had any tips from our experience here in Jasper of doing these cleanups, uh, especially in the time of COVID and uh, whatnot, um, of course, you know, above all else, think about safety uh, with your groups before you, you set them up. Um, when we do volunteer cleanups in this park, uh, I tend to send volunteer cleanups to work in places where they're not going to be, uh, you know, impacting traffic or be a danger. Um, there are good considerations where people work together, but of course spaced apart so that everyone knows where each other is at all times. Uh, carrying the right PPE for a landscape like this, making sure a few people have bear spray, know how to use it, and a really clear protocol on where people are and what to do if something goes wrong to come back to you. Um, so those things are really important. Um, don't overlook the value of small groups. Again, I think sometimes we tend to really gravitate to those big, giant, short line cleanup events, which, you know, to be honest, they're completely inspiring because there's so many people involved kids and whatnot, and you know, they're, they're beautiful things, but um, that might not be possible for a while. So don't overlook the value of small groups doing a lot of little cleanups. Uh, they make a really big impact just as much as a huge one day event might do. Um, they're a little bit easier to manage, and I would surmise that with social distancing, they're probably, um, probably the way to go for the next while. And yeah, like I say, uh, make sure you think about those overlooked lakes and ponds. Uh, stormwater lakes, ditches, they're all really, really easy to get to for the most part. And uh, they're right in our neighborhoods. So and they're very easy things to, to organize a couple of neighbors to go and take care of um, before we're able to get back into the business of uh, doing big shoreline cleanups and lakes and rivers and things like that. So yeah, uh, look to those places and don't, uh, don't overlook them if you get the chance to. And then lastly, um, you know, again, I wanted to be fair. <laughs> like, I know we're showing some photos of mountains and Sean's talking about rappelling into canyons and, and some of you folks are going like, seriously, like this isn't fair. Um, and, and I'm the same way too, <laughs> you know, like I can't go and visit all the other parks I would like to visit right now. Um, so if you're wishing you were in the mountains, there's some virtual ways that you can uh, engage with Jasper National Park. So uh, make sure to check out our website um, the link there, if it's uh, put into PDF form somehow, uh, anyway, that long link, long story short, is a list of Google Street View hikes and locations, not just in Jasper, but all across Parks Canada places. So uh, have a good look at that, and um, they're actually really fun. You can actually visit a lot of places that maybe you've never gone, um, even some of the remote parks like uh, Wood Buffalo, uh -huh, you know, where I work next. Um, the YouTube that we have for Jasper National Park, we have a very a uh, long playlist of a variety of different uh, videos you might want to tune in on and listen, uh, check them out. Some of them are educational, some of them are, you know, a few years old, but so the content is still totally important and uh, yeah, some of them might be inspiring, so they're good ways to visit. And of course, you can also follow us on social media. Uh, our national uh, social media channel is just simply at Parks Canada and uh, for Jasper National Park, it's at Jasper NP. And if you parlez vous français, then we have options for you in French as well. So be sure to check those out. If this has made you wish you were in the mountains, there are ways to see them uh, from home until we can come back. And that's what I had. Thank you so much, Kevin. That was amazing. Um, I definitely uh, learned a lot and have um, more thorough knowledge and now I want to learn even more and we I know we really appreciate those resources to kind of see more of Jasper and other national parks from home while that's um, our only option right now um, because uh, I'm definitely inspired to want to get outside right now um, and so like a lot of you I think I'll be spending some time in my backyard today um, and then a little bit of time on the computer digging into some future opportunities in Jasper and their surrounding national parks um, so I want to know um, if we have any questions and if we do you can pop them into the chat I'm sure Kevin can answer anything about Jasper Sean can answer anything 
um, kind of more uh, outdoor guiding about his specific cleanups. Um, and I can answer anything shoreline cleanup. Um, and um, take a couple minutes, think about uh, any specific questions, and we'll be glad to chat about them. If you have any comments or anything, um, let us know. Um, and I will get started answering these. So I think for the first one, I'm going to pass it over to Kevin. Um, someone, a Sherry is wondering, with the protection of natural and cultural heritage sites, is there a paradigm shift to give attention um, to what tourism might look like after COVID? Are we planning on maybe some less intrusive ways we can experience our natural areas and other recreations? It's definitely a tough question, Kevin, um, but a super interesting <laughs> conversation to have. Um, do yeah, you want to give that sure. a shot? <laughs> uh, I can try. Um, I, I, you know, on, well, let's start with, uh, you know, um, we're, 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 we're still in, in the, the mode of, of, of considering safety mm -hmm. first for, for, for all our Park staff and employees at different Parks Canada sites. So, you know, um, we're you know nationally we're starting to look at different ways to to open up parks and, and sites, and uh, but to do it in a way that's really gradual and do it safely, and in ways that um, I think kind of respects the the nature of the communities that we're working in. Because of course, you know, you can't just have one thing across Canada. This is very different in very different places, right? So, so there will definitely have to be ways of you know, changing the way that we operate in some regards, um, you know, safety again becoming uh, first and foremost. But yeah, I'm not really sure what that exactly looks like in the different parks. It's, it may look different in different places, but, you know, all the, the standard things you're seeing in other places like social distancing and wearing masks and keeping your distance from each other, those will have to be integrated into our, our, our health and safety practices at, at our parks. Um, I know that if you listen in on like webinars, there was a really good one yesterday uh, that the Calgary Chamber of Commerce had with Travel Alberta, and uh, they're very focused on you know ensuring that you know operators and businesses have really solid health and safety plans and think about how you're protecting the health and safety of your guests and and workers, um, you know, making people feel a little more secure in their operations. But you know, there isn't one really super clear answer to your question, Sherry. At this point, you'll just have to uh, stay tuned, follow your local park, and uh, yeah, you know the answers will all be coming shortly. Like we get guided by, um, you know, Public Health Agency of Canada, um, you know, uh, our management teams here in parks and sites across Canada, how to implement the measures that they recommend for us, and of course, you know, like I say, health and safety is first and foremost of all our operations. So, thanks for giving that one a shot, Kevin. I just want to add. Better. Um, that I think in general, it's a really good idea to try and make our, as individuals, our tourism um, less intrusive and try and make sure that we experience our natural areas in ways that are as responsible as possible. And I think one of the things that you can do um, is to follow the seven leave no trace principles. Um, they are outlined super well on their website um, and they're an awesome educational opportunity for adults and for kids. Um, I know that participating in those and being really cognizant of them has helped me and then you always set an example for those around you when you do that sort of thing. Um, so uh, here we got one um, for uh, Sean, I think. And then I can also speak to this as well. So um, we are wondering, I'm a paddle canoe instructor and we always see garbage in our takeouts and put-ins. What should we do as Kevin said to not overlook them? And from the perspective of an, an outdoor instructor, John, what do you think about that? Uh, and you're just talking about uh, take-ins and uh, put-ins and takeouts for, uh, Paddling? That's what the question is asking about. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't see uh, anything wrong with picking up the trash in the areas that you're going to be accessing there. I think the, the bigger challenge is, is safely accessing shorelines while you're going down a river and you can't eddy out. Um, as an instructor, as a guide, I guess, uh, from that perspective, I 
pick up trash every single time I'm out with my guests, if it's, a, if it's you know, there. Um, usually in Moline Canyon, it's, it's all, every day I pick up something. And uh, they really appreciate it, and they can see that we really, truly care about um, the natural ecosystems. And, uh, and that really goes a long way, is actually, not just in, in, you know, from my own heart wanting to give to the ecosystem, but just my clients uh, appreciating uh, me as a guide. So as an instructor, if you're able to pick up a few pieces of trash, if you had a, a second or two, um, that, that certainly works. Uh, and then going back, you know, when you don't have clients and, and picking up um, would be the best ways that, you know, like I do at Lane Canyon at Bridge 2, then I come back and then I have a story to share and I get to that put in on the river or, or uh, take out and, uh, and mention that, you know, we were just here last week and, and uh, hopefully it looks nice and pristine. We, we did an awesome cleanup here. That, that's kind of what I think of. Yeah, and I would say, so I'm also an Outdoor Council of Canada. Um, hiking leader. So uh, one of the things that I learned when I was taking that course, um, and I, this is a pretty simple answer, but, um, you know, you have your 10 essentials with you, but, you know, you might just stick a, a used plastic bag in your backpack as a um, trash bag. And we might have 11 essentials from now on, um, because caring for our environment is almost as important as our personal safety. Personal safety, of course, comes first, um, but that can just be a nice follow-up. Um, so there's a couple questions here for me. So um, we're wondering if there's an official shoreline cleanup period this spring. Um, unfortunately, right now we've suspended cleanups indefinitely. Um, we really want to be able to get back on, on our shorelines and our, our watersheds, um, but for the time being, um, it's not possible to do so in a way where we can guarantee the safety of our participants. Um, so we've suspended cleanup. We will be in communication with all of our participants, any potential future participants on social media and through all of our communication channels about when we will be resuming cleanups. Um, but just so everyone knows, uh, normally um, shoreline cleanups are possible all year round. Um, so we don't have an official start date, end date. Um, it's all the time as long as you are being safe and cognizant of the weather um, in your specific area. Um, so we have another question here for Sean, and then I can also speak to this one as well. <laughs> so on the canyon cleanups, are young children allowed? So curious as to how you make the cleanups inclusive to families while also being safe. Uh, yeah, so a everyone can participate because the trail is very safe. It's accessible, it's wheelchair accessible in one section. So it's, uh, it's accessible to all, and if children wanted to come along, then we just say to that family, just like we say to pretty much the rest of the public, uh, enjoy the canyon, um, grab pictures while you can, and if you see any trash, um, throw it in this bucket. And the kids love it, because <laughs> it gives them a bit more purpose. They, it, I find that the kids um, will lose interest a little bit more quicker, a little bit more quickly than um, adults do when they're visiting sites like this. And so if they get bored, because mom and dad are taking 10 minutes to take their pictures, uh, they'll go off and find a, a piece of trash or two and drop it in the bucket and they feel um, a sense of purpose. So um, yeah, and, and just like you would say to any child that's at a, a dangerous place, you know, don't jump the fence, don't hang over the fence, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. And I, I also want to add that one of the things that Shawline Cleanup really make sure, make sure that we push for is um, that there are cleanups available to everyone. And um, right now, not right now, but just in general, sometimes um, a cleanup might not be suitable for a certain group of people. So um, we want people to know that they can lead their own cleanups. Um, they can lead cleanups that um, fit their needs and we can help them with that. So if you happen to be going to Jasper and you're like, you know, I really want to do a canyon cleanup, but I'm only going to be there for a little bit and I don't know what to do, you can give us a call and we'll walk you through what you need to do. Maybe we'll hook you up with Sean or maybe we'll just help you do it on your own. Um, there's another question here that I love. Um, so how do you convince your manager Sherline cleanup is a good idea? Someone brought it forward as a programming idea um, and felt like it was dismissed. So that's a huge question and that's one that we work with a lot. So, you know, it depends on who you are, what workplace you're in, if there's um, certain things that we can do to help you make sure that that cleanup fits your programming. 
um, if there's any ways that our team can help you make sure that that looks ideal for your manager. And if you work in um, like a corporate office and you're just doing it as like a fun activity, um, we could help you plan a quick one hour lunchtime cleanup, which we do in our shoreline cleanup office. We've got a bunch of people who don't work on shoreline cleanup. We've got people who work on all sorts of other things. And so we say, hey, you know what? Uh, once a month, um, bring your lunch outside and we'll all go do a cleanup together. Um, so we can help you figure that out. Um, and if you want to talk about kind of the value of cleanups, um, I can give you some more information on that. But real quick, um, we've picked up millions and millions of pieces of trash um, over the past 27 years. And um, we have made such a tangible difference that the prime minister's office uses our litter data um, that we clean up during clean, that we pick up during cleanups. Um, to help guide uh, their legislative planning on single-use plastic removal. So that is only due to citizen scientists like all of you. So there is a huge value in the individual doing a cleanup. You, you participate in a large-scale effort that makes real tangible change happen. Um, so if anyone has any more questions, you can pop them into the chat, but it's about 11. And so I think we will wrap things up. Huge thank you to Sean and Kevin for participating. Both of their perspectives are so, so interesting. Um, here are, here's our contact info if you want to shoot any of them or myself an email um, if you have any questions. And uh, we're available on social media as well. Um, but this was super awesome. Great questions, everybody. Um, and I really look forward to seeing you all on the shorelines when it is safe to do so again. Uh, I'll just have a quick mention that uh, my email is just slightly off. It's uh, oh, so sorry. Yeah, it's okay. My last name is Proctor with an E, not an O. So it'd be S P R O C K T E R at gmail.com. I'm going to pop that into our chat here. You can always contact us through our website too, right? With Jasper Hikes and Tours. Um, that's another way to get a hold of us too. Yeah. And uh, I'll just I'll start a quick thing uh, for everybody on here as well. Uh, just a heads up for everybody, just like Julia was saying, um, in spite of all the, the fun stuff we just showed you in Jasper, uh, our, our volunteer program this summer in Jasper has actually been suspended. So um, if you want to volunteer in Jasper, we have a really wonderful organization called the Friends of Jasper National Park that does a lot of stewardship work. And uh, they're the group to connect with if you have time to do that. If you're living near Jasper and you thought, I got to go to Jasper, you know, once it's safe to do that, uh, look for the Friends of Jasper National Park and they're the organization to support this year. But, yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, a, a council member of the Jasper Trail Alliance, which is a subset of um, Friends of Jasper. So shorthand, you can always just contact me if you want to get a hold of Friends and I can direct you to the right person if you can't figure it out because I work with them too. Amazing. You guys have a bunch of really great resources right here. And I just popped in the correct email for Sean in the um, chat there. So sorry about that. Um, so thank you guys so much. Um, I just want to give a quick shout out to our next webinar that is um, about the Ontario Day of Action on Litter. That is happening next week. There's some super amazing plastics researchers um, from the Chelsea Rockman Lab at the University of Toronto. Um, and the University of Toronto trash team will be giving a whole bunch of information on upstream solutions to plastic pollution. So different topic, um, different people, still super interesting. Um, so thanks for tuning in, everyone, um, and hopefully see you all soon. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>